I would like to call to order a special meeting of the Southern California Logistics Airport Authority and the City Council of the City of Victorville. Concurrently, I would also like to call to order the regular meeting of the City Council of the City of Victorville and the Southern California and the City Council sitting at the Library Board of Trustees, Southern California Logistics Rail Authority, Southern California Logistics Airport Authority, Victorville Redevelopment, Redevelopment Agency, and the Victorville Water District. Uh, public comment is item number one. Anyone wishing to address the, the council? Step up to the podium. This is under public comment. You're, Mr. Hoach, you're on number, item three, right? Okay. We'll now go into item number two. Talk. Um, in the... Um, Item number two, under under uh, discussion, possible uh, action by the board was requested to be put on the agenda by Councilman Rothschild. Is that the item? You to? Item number two. What? Um, oh, this is the Jim Worsham one here. Here it is. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I've given everybody a, a little bit of a summary of. Uh, what Jim is uh, proposing on his uh, ongoing contract. He, to make it very simple, what I'm asking for is uh, uh, a contract uh, agreement with Jim Worsham, uh, 100000 ongoing to the end of the year, and uh, continuing uh, with the agreement that any business brought in to SCLA on his volition would be a commission type of basis. Uh, as I understand it, there's an agreement kind of between the city and the um, um, and Jim over the commission part. There's still a question on the hundred thousand going forward. So as you look down the list of things that Jim Worsham has been involved with, he, you you can read his letter that he sent to me, and I, I gave copies to each of the council members. There's also a kind of an outline of various projects he's been directly involved with. It's a tremendous list, and I su submit that uh, half of this list wouldn't even be here today without Jim's uh, direct hand in that, especially the AP program, which I think he had a very direct hand in, uh, in getting a significant start on and the uh, personal uh, efforts that he's put into that. Uh, you pay a school district uh, uh, superintendent uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and I'm not suggesting the AP school measures up to a, a high school or elementary school district. Nevertheless, uh, that AP program is going to produce jobs at SCLA. That's what we've been about for all of the years that we've been working at uh, George, former George Air Force Base. And this is a direct link to job creation and career maintain, maintenance in the area. So I don't want to lose Jim Worsham. He's, he's got programs he's involved in today uh, looking forward that um, I'm sure will not even come to anywhere close to fruition if he's not, if his presence isn't there. I, did you have that little uh, schematic? I had a, a hanger thing. One of the visions he had some years ago, and it's still in play, and matter of fact, more so today than ever before, uh, each of those uh, four hangers out there, uh, four-way hangers are as big as the big hangers, we, the brand new ones we've built, except this would be a complex uh, out there at the airport uh, focused in one spot, and uh, that's not a pipe dream, Lockheed Martin and FedEx and Boeing and Northrop. Those are all personal connections of Jim Worsham's uh, that he's working on and are very close to some of the uh, companies saying, yes, we have a very direct interest in this. This uh, complex, by the way, can be built one hangar at a time or all at once, depending on how the business were to flow in and the commitments from the various companies. So you can see just by that schematic and uh, the list of uh, activities that Jim has been involved with that uh, we can't afford to let this gentleman's uh, skill and his experience uh, uh, go away. And I know that uh, we're pinching pennies right now in an incredible way I've never to, that I've never seen the city before uh, focus in on. Um, and I'm asking for a consideration of 100000 on an ongoing basis here uh, as a platform of his um, uh, contract to plus the uh, uh, the um, bonus as, as you get a FedEx or a Lockheed Martin, which is a, the government contract, the maintenance on the C-5s and the rest of them going. If you get those uh, coming in, each one of those are hundreds of jobs. That big hangar there could be worth a thousand jobs altogether when it's in full production. So uh, anyway, that's 
what I wanted to, when I heard that uh, we had canceled this contract, I wasn't sure the full status of it at the time, but uh, that's my proposal to the council is that they consider uh, Jim Worsham's contract and uh, um, grant him an extension on that one. I'm okay with it. What we see at, George, at former George Air Force Base, uh, most all of that which is there is a direct result of the connections and the tenacity of Jim Worsham. I don't know who we have. I mean, we've got basically three people. We've got Keith and we've got Peter. I guess that's it now in terms of direct involvement from a historical standpoint. Uh, who would pick up the pieces with some of these things that are ongoing? So I, I have no problem with your recommendation. I, um, I could not support that recommendation, and I'll, I'll tell you why. We asked our city manager to look at all the contracts because we had a, a bundle of these contracts and we're in a tight situation right now financially, and we asked them to look at all the contracts and come back with us on individual contracts and, and recommend to us how he would like to proceed with those. And I think he did have a recommendation on that one. It wasn't the, the $100,000, uh, Mr. Cox, am I correct? Uh, yes, you're correct, Mr. Mayor. What, uh, what happened is uh, shortly after I began reviewing contracts, we... We had actually two contracts uh, at the base, Mr. Warsham, Mr. Fox. Mr. Fox is not a part of this uh, discussion, but they, similar contracts, they worked at the base. I gave the city council complete reports in regard to the contracts, uh, what had been paid, and, and at that time they included this same information, I believe, is in regard to what they had been involved in. Contracts uh, had expired, I believe, in November, December, January, I can't remember. But they had not been renewed. They were ongoing. And, of course, when I got council's authorization to cancel contracts, I did so because the intent was to renegotiate those contracts that were uh, necessary. Um, that one came back to the council very rapidly uh, with a request that it be continued through June. And uh, the contracts were signed. Um, uh, they were to come back to the city council uh, for reconsideration or to the manager for reconsideration based upon, uh, I guess, mission accomplished or accomplishments uh, from January to June. And primarily, I guess, because of the economic uh, times, there were, were no accomplishments uh, during that period of time or very little. Um, I had indicated that since the city was cutting back and laying off employees and canceling programs and finding it very difficult to even submit a budget, that I would be agreeable to a performance uh, contracts. Uh, and they would have to be negotiated because each item or, or each incident would have to be uh, separate in regard to what you pay uh, in regard to some kind of a fee. And it would be on the basis that uh, you didn't show up one day with something in hand and say you owe me 10 percent. It would be on the basis that uh, the contractor or the consultant would submit a calendar of the things that they would work on and then there would be agreeable fees if they were successful in regard to those issues. During the reorganization, um, I had notified redevelopment uh, that they were going to have to be uh, cutting substantially and also the base and I previously have told the council that the airport is substantially in the hole. And I shared with uh, Keith Metzler, who is now in charge of the base, that he needed to look at a half a dozen items. We discussed those and look at the contracts. And I know that he had looked at this uh, particular contract, and we had uh, discussed it a, a little bit in regard to what his needs were and what he could justify and what he was working on uh, and where he could use help or, or not use help. Um, but I guess because of the time, and we have been awfully busy with other items that uh, before any kind of an agreement could be negotiated with Keith Metzler, uh, that the item came back to the council. But Keith is prepared to discuss the matter uh, with the council if council is interested, since he is, in fact, in charge of uh, the airport base activities. 
Donald. Uh, well, it, yeah, it was just my understanding that we were going to continue to engage uh, Mr. Worsham in the same way that we did um, Guy Fox, and uh, it's my understanding that that staff has been working on that with Mr. Worsham. I, I'd like to hear from uh, uh, Keith Metzler as to the status of that. Um, I, you know, I have not worked with Jim as long as the rest of you have, so. Um, I think Jim's an honorable, honorable guy. I think there's a lot of good that uh, he can do. I just, um, I, I think I'd like to hear from staff on where they're at and talks with them. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Um, I have had the opportunity to um, look uh, at the issue involving the contract, not only uh, involving Jim Worsham, uh, but also involving Guy Fox. Uh, I've inherited this uh, for about maybe 30 days now, um, and one of the most important things that I was tasked with was uh, taking uh, the consideration of Mr. Jim Worsham and his contract. Um, one of the things that I found um, as a part of my exercise especially at this time when funding is constrained. I mean, very plainly put, uh, I think the characterization of the operations uh, at the airport running thin, uh, that is exactly correct. We are operating paper thin uh, in terms of revenues versus expenditures, which causes us to take an extremely keen uh, look at uh, extracurricular expenditures. And I think even though uh, Mr. Worsham has been extremely valuable. There's no question about that and his value to uh, the success uh, over the past. We're at a time right now that given our uh, finite amount of resources, we have to clearly identify what exactly our needs are. Uh, and what Mr. Worsham does is definitely in that realm of marketing. He's been very successful. Uh, but one of the things that I did find that I was troubled with, but I think perhaps helped make this exercise a little bit easier, was the fact that he had a fairly general contract with respect to what he was being asked to work on. And uh, that being said, it was difficult to, to clearly pinpoint uh, progress as to those items that he was working on. He had a very large breadth of uh, uh, projects that he was working on. And at the end of the day, one of the biggest challenges that we uh, were running into was if, in fact, he's successful a lot of these projects, are they, in fact, projects that we can uh, uh, carry out? You know, one of the most fundamental beliefs I have when, when you're marketing is we need to be marketing things that we actually can follow through on, that we can actually fulfill. So let's market resources, uh, the availability of resources that we can actually follow through on at the end of the day. So with that in mind, one of the things clearly that has been making it easier is trying to identify what resources we do have uh, for users. One of the hardest, one of the nicest luxuries we have at the airport today is the fact that our hangars are leased, and they're leased in large part due to Mr. Worsham. But in that regard, it makes very little sense to continue to market to users that need hangar space that we just don't have available. So it, this has allowed us to be a much more precise in terms of what we want. Uh, one of the clear items that we've determined uh, worthwhile pursuing is, is pursuing um, aircraft companies such as Boeing who have interest in flight testing and expanding their flight test programs. Uh, to where there may even be willingness from them to build their own hangars. That's something we can accommodate because we have land. Um, but if, if it was a case where they need hangar space, we just are out of space and we can't fulfill that need. So one of the things that I have done, and I literally just haven't gotten to being able to extend some kind of contract to Mr. Worsham, we we're getting there, is developing a contract that's very pointed in scope and very pointed in how that individual got compensated. Uh, Mr. Cox was absolutely correct that we have evolved into trying to establish a contract that's compensated more on a fee-for-service, more on a brokerage-type uh, relationship. And uh, when we had first commenced discussions with Mr. Worsham about that, he was opposed to it. But as we uh, worked with him and had him understand uh, the financial constraints that we uh, have as a city, also to get him to understand 
the much more narrower scope that we were going to look for him to reform. He actually came around and started working with us, and, and as of last week, he was very acceptable to working on some kind of brokerage relationship with us. Um, if it was a very clear cut, um, council asking uh, staff to develop a contract and just pay a straight compensation, um, um, I would have to advise to you right now, it would be my recommendation that based on our dollars and cents position today, we could not do that. I would not recommend it to you uh, because I could not measure the results within the, the operating period of the next 12 months that is our fiscal year. But if it was a restructured contract in such a way where it was based upon performance and we clearly established a um, schedule of pay to where that schedule of pay caused a net zero effect to our O&M for SCLA, that's a different story. That's something that we probably could support, and that's probably something that could be the, the middle ground uh, with all of this. Um, so with that, uh, that'd be a path that I'm willing to pursue, but uh, definitely take uh, uh, your direction. Well, let me just add to my comments, and, and uh, I, I know what uh, Mr. Warsham has done at the, at the, uh, at the airport. Uh, we've seen his work, and uh, this, my reluctance to accept just to clear $100,000 a year is not based on, on anything else other than what we're in the financial bind. Uh, our staff, including our city manager, uh, has uh, been directed to look at all the contracts and basically come back with performance-based contracts if it's merited. And so that was my only uh, reason for that. If you come back with a performance-based uh, contract that's acceptable to, to the city and, and to uh, Mr. Worsham, then certainly, you know, I, I wouldn't be opposed to that. I, I do have something that's drafted, and it's something that I was planning on extending to Mr. Worsham. I wish I could have done it sooner because I, he's been very clear with us that he was going to work through July. Uh, on his own uh, dime. Uh, uh, I just did not have enough information up until very recently to be able to put that together. I did put something together last night that I feel comfortable in extending to him, and at the same time I think it's responsible to the organization to where uh, what we're asking him to do isn't going to uh, uh, cost the authority uh, directly unless he actually performs. Um, one of the things that we did get to look at, and I think it's um, measurable in the contract, is that we got him focused on certain projects that I think we decided we just not, did not have the capability to do. Something like Boeing, uh, the flight test program is an example that I think he probably is the best equipped to be able to broker and, and do that deal. But there were also several other things that he was working on that certainly between myself and Mr. Soderquist and the staffing uh, that we do have as support staff to the organization, there are definitely things that we could take on to keep him focused on what is really important to the authority. So um, uh, what I have drafted, uh, I feel fairly confident with. It would require us to extend it to him, and then, of course, there would probably be an ensuing negotiation. And not sure if what we have put uh, uh, a uh, pen to paper on is acceptable to him, but it, it would at least allow us to start that negotiation process. Um, the delay is not to construe that we did not think anything less of his importance. He's extremely important, I know, to you and also to staff. Um, we'll move forward, and I think uh, uh, with your support, we'll, we'll go ahead and extend something to him that is responsible to the organization and bring it back to the council if we can come to uh, recommended terms. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to take your word for it, Keith. That uh, if if we could afford the, the hundred thousand, it, it's it's value added and, uh, in my way of thinking, a security item for Jim not leaving, uh, either retiring or going someplace else. I'm not sure where else he would go, but the fact is that uh, I don't want the contacts and the expertise that he has, the potential that he brings to that airport out there is incredible. Uh, I mean, uh, the jobs that could come out of the FedEx contact and the uh, the government contracts with the C5 maintenance program. And he made an observation that I, at the time, I didn't think anything of it, but it's probably quite true, as you'll notice that the current administ federal administration is cutting back on brand new development, 
Well, if you think about think that through for a minute, the, the flip side of that is if you're not going to build new stuff, what are you going to do? You're going to maintain the equipment you've got, the C5s and the other programs that are out there, and all of a sudden Victorville looms very big in that type of a, of a footprint. Uh, so um, I'm hoping that uh, we can satisfy Mr. Worsham with a contract that uh, he'll stay with us on. Um, I still feel that the 100000 is fair, but uh, um, I know that we're pinching pennies in the city right now and uh, in ways that we've never done before. And I, I certainly don't want to put any one thing above another. And police, fire, and streets is number one, and the rest of it is number two. So uh, with that, I would encourage then the council to at least go ahead, as you've outlined, and uh, support the uh, approach, Jim, with a contract uh, on a uh, basis for his uh, accomplishments. I'll, uh, I'll move forward, and I would look forward to bringing something back to the board. I might. Um, Questions? I, I am probably Mr. Warsham's biggest uh, booster, biggest fan. I was involved in the original decision to bring him here. Um, I'm encouraged uh, about the fact you're going to extend some type of a contract, and I don't think anybody at this dais wants to be involved in the nitty-gritty of contract negotiations. And if you can hammer out an arrangement uh, with Jim Worsham that causes him to stay engaged and stay enthused, um, I think that's wonderful. I'm also one of your biggest boosters and one of your biggest fans. So please don't take what I'm going to say as a criticism. But the reality is, in my individual judgment, that you're stretched awfully thin and that with all of the things that we're trying to do, I am concerned that without a Jim Warsham, things will slip through the cracks, not because anybody is not enthused about it, but you only have so many hours a day. And Peter Sodequest only has so many hours a day. So I'm, I'm really encouraging you to really get into a discussion with Jim. Jim loves this city. He loves the airport. And I, I recognize that we're in tough economic times, but remember, we made a commitment to the Victor Valley in 1992. We would do everything in our power to use former George Air Force Base as the primary economic engine of the desert focused on creating jobs. The vast majority of the jobs that we've created have been uh, in large measure through the efforts of Jim Warsham to bring world-class companies there. And I don't think that we have either the connections or the time to send you or any other staff member into the aviation world or the uh, goods movement world and, and do the things that need to be done. So I just, you know, I, I, I I'm glad I'm not in your shoes or Jim Cox's shoes or the other department head's shoes having to wrestle with these very, very tough issues. But um, I encourage you to be as innovative and as creative as you can. Uh, we have some wonderful programs out there that, in my opinion, we will lose if we lose Jim Warsham. And so um, I, I, I wish you luck because I think it's important once we're behind uh, the uh, mess that we're in right now, once the financial situation begins to improve, and it will at some point, uh, we still have a primary mission out there, and that primary mission is to create jobs. And uh, he is an essential, or at least has been an essential part of that. Anybody else? Then uh, Mike... Uh, to, well, you didn't make a motion. No, so. I'm going to make a motion, and then if it, uh, if it fails, I'll make another one. My motion is that uh, we um, continue with Jim Worsham on a $100,000 contract and uh, commission basis. That would be my initial idea and my motion. I still think that that dollar value is there uh, in spite of our, our, our hard uh, issues that we've got. So that would be my motion. Second. No second. Fails. Well, that's okay. well, I want to second it, but I, 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 I'm going to defer for the time being to uh, 
Keith's representation that he can't afford it out of the budget, that there isn't the 100000 but that he will proceed in good faith to negotiate something uh, with, with Jim. Uh, but while I'm not prepared to second it at this time, I, I will tell you, Mr. Rothschild is the maker of the motion, I, I certainly uh, would want to revisit this in two weeks at the next regularly scheduled council meeting to see where we're at because uh, I think it's that important to the long-term economic health. Of well, I, I don't have a problem with that. I, I, I think that there is some significant turnaround in this city as soon as the audit comes up and the other things and the bonding uh, ratings come back. I think the issue of the 100000 is not going to be nearly as critical as it is at this very moment, and you're being very responsible in a department head fa fashion saying, today, i got to tell you no. But a month from now, you know, that answer may or may not be different. But uh, uh, so I'm, I'm more or less trying to look through this thing and make sure that we don't – Jim's not here tonight because he's in a hospital getting hip replacement. So I could probably say this, and he probably wouldn't get word back. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, if, if the negotiations without the 100000 were to fail, I would hope he'd come back to the council and, and tell us that and then see what we are at. So, I mean, that, I w didn't want to put that out as a public statement and then say, well, there, there you go. we got another option to be out there. But um, – he is uh, worth more jobs than anybody that I can think of in the, in the last five, six, seven years in this city. And, uh, and he is worth more jobs coming in the next few years than, than I can think of. So I just do not want him going away, frustrated or any other way. And that's, that's and I'll withdraw my motion. Item number three. Box. I didn't find my agenda. That's how prepared I am. <laughs> um, item number three um, is a request to uh, sell these turbine generators. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Amr Jaker, the Director of Public Works, to make a presentation uh, on this item. Uh, and give you the reasons as to why uh, we are moving ahead with selling uh, the equipment. You have information in front of you that requires under the current ordinances and the rules and regulations that it be declared surplus uh, under the recommendations of staff. And I've talked with staff, met with staff, read the recommendations carefully. I agree with the recommendations, have declared it surplus, but because of the council's involvement and the long history involved in and uh, this equipment and some other items associated with uh, this particular program uh, felt that this should come before the council for a full disclosure and a full discussion for the council, that the council should approve of this because they certainly was the approving entity in starting the program initially and the involvement that the city has been involved in in regard to purchasing the equipment and the whole program uh, as it relates to uh, the combustion turbine generator and the heat recovery steam generator. So uh, this obviously is a discussion on Foxborough. It has had a lot of discussion by the council, by the staff, and the news media. And uh, so we're a little bit sensitive in regard to this whole issue. And Amr and his staff has, uh, is, and the staff from our Vemus, uh, the Municipal Utility uh, District, they have studied this, and he, Mr. Uh, Armour Jaker, the Director of Public Works, is prepared to make a presentation to the Council at this time. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Uh, Honorable Mayor and Council Members, as, as the item in the discussion, under, the, under discussion in this item, as it says that um, when the Foxborough facility was originally planned, it was planned as a 15 megawatt facility. Later on, as the need for electricity grew and there were other issues that came up, the, the facility was uh, redesigned to handle a, a bigger uh, electric load. The, the design went from 15 to 20 and then finally to 49.5 megawatt. Um, the, when the, the design was being done, the construction was also progressing. So some of the design, when the design was completed, some of the installations that are there, they are there for 49.5 49 megawatts. Um, we had acquired 
three of these generators and uh, steam recovery systems. Two of them were installed at the, at the site, at the Foxborough site, and one of them has been sitting there for the last few years at, the, at Carson and Abilene. Uh, there are two parts to it. Um, we've looked at this very carefully, and we think that if we move forward with this facility at all, it has to be a large generator. It cannot be a small generator because of the um, efficiency that we need to be able to sell this electricity to, um, to anybody that needs to buy it. These generators are designed basically to work, uh, to produce five megawatts, but also produce a lot of steam. The steam goes into a facility like Neutro, and then we recover the, the, the uh, revenues from there and combine revenues of, of steam and electricity, make this, uh, make this uh, a viable option. Now, as you know, the Foxborough now is at interconnect. The maximum load that we see there is between four and five megawatts. So we have equipment for 15 megawatts, which is not very efficient. Our loads are at about five megawatts. But if we have, if we were to finish the uh, complete the facility, we should be looking at a 49.9 megawatt facility, doing a substation and doing an interconnect with that. And there is other options that have come up um, regarding bio. Uh, using biomass and doing biogas and other options. And we're, we can look at all of those things. But in the context of where we are today, this equipment that we have is basically not needed for Foxborough. We have requested, and, uh, and Mr. Cox has declared this equipment surplus. Um, we've been negotiating with uh, several, several buyers. Um, in fact, there is additional information uh, since the report was written. Last week, we had received two offers on on the units, the um, the, sec the first one, the first buyer, the the one that was higher, was for 1.85 million. Second buyer was for 1.75 million. The second buyer did not have any conditions to attached. The first buyer wanted to uh, inspect the the equipment. Also had some other conditions related relating to software and some other issues. Um, subsequent to the Friday's conversations, the second buyer, or the first buyer, which is 1.75, uh, which is offering 1.85 million dollars, has reviewed the equipment, but still have some, still has some questions. We've talked to, we've talked to the buyer that offered 1.75 million dollars, which is Allen Bro Energy Corporation, and they're willing to, they, they want us to look at their offer as well. They do not have a written offer at this point. So, um, and since this thing changes day to day, uh, my recommendation to council is that that council authorize staff to enter into an agreement in the range of 1.75 million net or higher with any one of these two companies that can come up with a purchase and sale agreement and $100,000 hard money deposit. And that we will assure that the equipment will be sold for a price that's above the lowest bid that we received. Um, the, uh, we've, we, it, this is a very hard equipment to sell, especially under the, considering the, the economic conditions that we are in. Um, there, we've, we've tried to sell this uh, several times before. Last month or so, we had some buyers uh, from, an, from a South American country. They came in and looked at it, and they ended up buying a different unit. Um, so these things, are, these, uh, these um, sale Sale agreements are very hard to put together. The, the buyers want the information very fast, and that's the reason for having this uh, on this meeting, on a special meeting, and then subsequent um, addendum to, uh, to the inform information that was provided. Um, this concludes my report. I'll be happy, happy to answer any questions. Is any of this equipment, uh, is any of this equipment involved in the ongoing uh, discussions with uh, Walters Power and that set of equipment? No, this is not, th that equipment is separate from this. Uh, secondly, although it's not a part of the issue uh, in the recommendation, I'm, I'm curious about the 49.5 megawatts. You know, at one point, the city was uh, aggressive in uh, trying to move forward with uh, some energy uh, projects in the Foxborough area. Um, I realize it wouldn't be appropriate to, to do it tonight, but at some point in the near future, I'd like to kind of have a, an update as to the totality of the energy issues at Foxborough 
where we're at, where we may be going at some time in the future when the economy improves, because it seems like it's kind of it's kind of gone onto the back burner, and, and I at least don't really have a clear view as to where we're at and where we hope as a city to be going. So it's not urgent, but I would like at some point to have that kind of a status report. We are reviewing the, we are in, we're preparing an inventory of all the equipment that's at Foxborough, um, and we're also looking at the plans and uh, looking at what options are available. As you know, we have applied for an energy grant uh, to, to the tune of $43 million. If we receive that grant, uh, there's an option to move forward in a certain way. If we don't receive that grant, then we need to come up with a the, with the solution to the Foxborough issue. Any other questions? I'd like to <clears throat> hear more about the, uh, the reuses that we could have at Foxborough as well. I think that there's various options there, and that certainly that renewable market is a dynamic thing and seems month to month the issues are changing and uh, I look at it more as a self-inflicted wound by the state but nevertheless it's it's a land it's law of the land AB 32 is going to push the renewables and if we've got an opportunity to put a project in play there then uh, the council needs to be briefed on that uh, as to how we might be able to do that I, we, we can certainly do that thank you we do have a uh, speaker, uh, Mike Hoach. Well, I just want to make something uh, quick here. Uh, my name is Mike Hoach. <clears throat> I've been uh, involved in uh, liquidation and, of uh, city surplus uh, items across the United States for 45 years. Worked as an independent contractor from uh, large companies all across the country. I just happened to see, and now I just heard that we had three bids uh, that we're looking at. I'm wondering why we don't go the auction method and find out what it's, what it's really worth. There's several options we can take. We can have a starting bid. We can have a. We can sell it. Uh, Subject to the city's approval, just because we have an option doesn't mean it has to go away. When I saw we're going to get all of a sudden we're going to sell this, and I kind of been watching this and talking about some people in the city, and it looked like it was going to be a while before we dispose of any of this equipment. Now it looks like we're getting ready to do it. I'm wondering, um, as president of an auctioneer association for 25 years, I'm wondering why we haven't gone to the auction method and just. Uh, Let's just see if we can, in our hearts, we'll know we got the most for it. Rather than take two or three bids from a broker, I'm wondering why we didn't go this method. Uh, I'd be glad to uh, uh, help you with my expertise, if I could. No charge, of course. I just, uh, I can't see the city taking a big hit on a couple of generators if, uh, if we've only got three bids. It doesn't make sense to me. I think that's all if uh, anybody's got any questions. Question? I, I, I tend to agree with your comment, and I, I don't want us to lowball ourselves too much on this equipment, even though uh, we've gotten into a, a problem area here. The fact is that uh, there are reasonable ways to get out, and, and the results are we owe the taxpayers the maximum value on that. So um, your comments aren't lost on me, and I, I'm not sure if, um, going to the open bid is the, is the way to do it or not. Uh, uh, we've got a piece of real estate and a piece of asset sitting there, and the longer we wait, uh, uh, the less value it has, I suppose. But uh, and there seems to be some options that uh, we're not experts on here that uh, for that equipment that somebody like yourself or other people that are out there in the bidding community. But at the moment, we've got uh, two offers here before us that seem to be in an area, and you're saying they're quite a bit lower than they ought to be for those that equipment, in your experience. Well, I, that I don't know. I don't. Maybe they're fair bids. Without investigating, I don't know. But I'm wondering how much investigation we did as a city. We know what that's worth. We don't know if they're fair bids because we got three or four bids. Uh, maybe our public works director can get some information. And in, in I think Chuck. Uh, Chuck McKay has uh, been kind of assigned to 
very obvious uh, when the speaker is finished so that we don't engage in a debate. He'll be more, uh, he'll be available for questions and to make a brief presentation to the council. That's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Chuck Bouquet, Risk Manager, City of Victorville. Um, I appreciate the speaker's comment relative to inquiring as to why we didn't do auction or bid. I think it's important to point out, and I would understand with the staff report given that it, the background and context, if you will, which is an issue I always talk about here in the city uh, relative to Foxborough and other matters. But that being said, please be aware that there have been, that I'm aware of, six different um, uh, brokers, if you will, that's doing international uh, promoting and marketing relative to this equipment. It's a very specialized market. Um, and as uh, Mayor Cabriales will recall with the Venezuelan interests, uh, uh, timing is the key, uh, demand is the key relative to the actual equipment, and availability is the key. In this uh, circumstance, there was considerable um, uh, marketing and promotion that has been going on for the last year, as you know, we're involved in the, the city's involved in litigation relative to Foxborough, um, which is a separate issue. But we, once we became capable of being able to go through and assess the value and mitigate our damages, and that would include selling equipment that we could not use for a project that could not fo go forward as had been proposed, we had a responsibility to determine the value of that equipment and then to seek all, any and all opportunities within that specialized industry as resources and get the highest and best dollars that could be available for that equipment. We're at a bit of a disadvantage with this particular equipment, despite the fact it's brand new because of the time that had passed, warranties were gone. The value of this equipment was established as far from the standpoint of a base threshold amount that was verified with our consultants, as well as staff resources and industry resources that we conferred with. And in essence, all we're doing, and I don't want to oversimplify it because it's big, but it is material as you would understand if you were considering purchase of this equipment, is that the price that is being considered by the city and this offer contemplates is this new equipment that has never been run, has been sitting for years, and has absolutely no warranty. This is an as proposed as an as is, where is transaction. Buyer beware, they take the equipment, it's theirs, and they pay us for that equipment. Um, these companies, I've been actually handling the negotiations for the city with the brokers and with the various interests uh, as to terms and conditions and, and helping uh, Armour's department relative to the values and things as such and logistics. But they've been out, they've inspected the equipment. Um, this actual offer that's here before you tonight is the highest of the two. Um, we actually were pleasantly surprised to get two offers, but keep in mind we were dealing with one piece of equipment at that point in time, and that's unit number three. So while that's encouraging, the Allenboro group that uh, Mr. Jocker referred to had hoped they were going to be the, the guys in the front of the pack. They got beat by $90,000 uh, as far as net to the city. Uh, so that's why we have the Lincoln Group uh, proposal here as far as the offer for us to then consummate the deal. We've already got a draft purchase and sale agreement ready to move forward. Um, the good news for the city is, is when we were initially looking at at least one of these generators, uh, being able to be surplus and sold to recover some of our losses relative to the projects and such. By interest of having the Allenboro Group involved, and they've been quite involved and made several trips out here, and they're coming back out here Thursday, they may be interested in buying one of the existing generators at Foxborough, possibly both. So this could end up with such an opportunity for the city. Uh, while I appreciate an offer relative to auctioneering services, um, the challenge could be is a very limited market. The only way you're going to get people here to bid for something like that, other than through the broker outreach that has been done by trained uh, industry experts, if you will, uh, with just the only, their only compensation being a, a percentage of commission uh, above the threshold. Um, I don't know that you necessarily would get any different results than we've gone through the last year with seeking opportunities to sell this equipment. And with that, I'm available to answer any questions you have. Question? Well, I, I'm just curious from an administrative standpoint. How did you as our risk manager get involved <laughs> in peddling obsolete or no longer usable it, equipment? Well, what happened if I could offer, and, and I, it's a case of where I do whatever I can to help the city and sometimes take a beating for that depending on which day you read the newspaper. Uh, but having said that, how that occurred is I also am responsible for contract administration for the city, and there were agreements that were brought forth to the city uh, that were not favorable or beneficial to the city under our contract administration scope. So 
from making the brokers unhappy saying that's not going to fly and this needs to be commissioned above the threshold amount and under the terms and conditions it will dictate not what you want it to be. It evolved into communication and dialogue and Amr said why don't you just continue rolling with that. They've helped with the logistics. Um, I've been holding hands with the brokers and their representatives and I think that we've made a pretty good team in uh, keeping this moving forward. So we were looking for continuity and obviously or the, my objective is just to be part of the solution and we work together to try to accomplish that. So that's how it happened. I just happened to pick up the phone the wrong day. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, sir. I agree. Timing is essential here, and we do have an opportunity to uh, perhaps, uh, hopefully it will be quick, uh, um, sell the, this, these assets that we have that have been sitting here for a while, and, and we're not using them. And so, um, <coughs> no, I, I think folks in a motion to, to go ahead and with staff recommendation to have the city manager uh, enter into a contract with uh, either one of the... Uh, I'll move staff uh, recommendation. I'd like to add just to clarify that motion include that uh, the city manager has made the determination declaration that the equipment is in fact surplus. It's already in the materials we've received. Second. Item number four, uh, under the uh, special meeting, it's a closed session. Also under the regular meeting uh, of the city council and, uh, and his boards and uh, in districts, we also have a closed session. Correct, Mayor Cabriales, the uh, uh, items for discussion and closed session are fully agendized uh, on the agendas. Uh, two of them deal with property negotiations, the other two deal with uh, litigation. And to the extent there's any reportable action with respect to any one of those items, we will come out and report that at the conclusion of the uh, closed session. I will now reconvene the meetings, the regular meetings of the Library Board of Trustees, Southern California Logistics Rail Authority, Southern California Logistics Airport Authority, Victorville Redevelopment Agency, Victorville Water District, and City Council of the City of Victorville. As customary, we'll have the invocation that will be given by Pastor Ray Gim from the Jubilee Community Church that will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by our Chief of Police, uh, Captain Reynolds. Mayor Cabrales, before, uh, if I could just interrupt, there was no reportable action out of either the special meeting closed session or the regular session closed session. Regular meeting closed. Father, we come before you tonight and we face many challenges in our city. And we thank you for leaders that are really seeking you and are really looking for your direction. And God, as a, as a people, as a city, as citizens of Victorville, we come before you tonight, and God, we just ask you to give our leaders wisdom, and we ask your blessing on this meeting in Jesus' name. Amen. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States. 
public for which it stands. Item number one is the public comment. And I do have cards. Uh, Dorothy Miller. Dorothy Miller. Why fill out a white card? No one ever responds to them. Here we're asked to do something, and nobody does anything. I never got a response yet. Did we pay the, for the trip to Vegas? Did we pay for the trip out of the country? Where is the budget? Having a hard time because you have, have to hide things that we found in the first people that was doing the audit? What is going on? Things are not getting done. What happened to the grand opening of Sunset Park and Fire Station? That's not done yet. Money bags pay off some council members. Is this good for the people? What goes on in the back room? Some deals made? Council members think they are better than the people. Money bags by the council members. We don't need this. Still on China. Let's, <laughs> let's give China up. We already got a big lawsuit on it. Uh, is there something going on that you guys think you need to still go for China? You guys got, need to take care of the money. You need to get back and do things for this city. The city needs to be taken care of. Not everything for the airport. Now, I'd really like some answers, and I'd like them in writing, so I can refer back to them if you don't answer them. That's what happened last time. That's why they're back on this piece of paper tonight. Thank you. Tom LaFortune. Good evening, members. <clears throat> I hate to say this, but I've been on the road for quite a few years. So I just sold my truck last year. And seeing what you people done, I missed out on a lot of mistakes. In case you don't know, why you're sitting there is to take care of the people of Victorville, not yourselves. You're supposed to be representing them, not buying stupid equipment for a hundred and some million dollars that you know nothing about. You cannot keep taking money that doesn't belong to you and toss it out the window. If this was private sector, you would be in jail. And you look at contracts, what does that mean? You have two lawyers sitting side by side, neither one of you can figure out how to do your paperwork. But yet you keep burying the city, walk around patting each other on the back, saying you do a good job. I don't see how. Come next election, I imagine the city of people, the city in, of uh, Victorville is going to have some new members up there and I will be one of them, hopefully, leading the parade. We'll now go into our regular um, uh, meetings. And the first one is the Library Board of Trustees. Are there any revisions? There are no revisions. Uh, we have the consent calendar, item number three. Move for approval. Second. Next, we have the Southern California Logistics Rail Authority and Southern California Logistics Airport Authority, and our chairman, uh, Councilman Cowell, will uh, chair those. Thank you, Mayor Cabriales. Item three on the Rail Authority agenda is the consent calendar. Second. That concludes the Rail Authority agenda, the Airport Authority agenda. 
Item three is the consent calendar. Motion would be in order. Approval. Second. Item four is a contract with Busco Unity. Excuse me, I need one more vote, um, Chairman Caldwell. Well, I keep clicking and then it reverts. I'll put it, okay. Okay. Item four is a contract to Butsco Utility Design, Inc., $41,800 for design and coordination of the DPSG Building Dry Utility. Okay. Second. Item five is a contract, again, to Butsco Utility Design, Inc., for 103300 for design and coordination of the SCLA Eastside Dry Utility System. Move for approval. Second. That concludes the Airport Authority agenda. Chairman Caldwell, I'd like to add something to that agenda. It's also going to be needed for the City Council. There is a uh, potential litigation that I think affects both the Airport Authority and the City, uh, pursuant to Government Code 54954.2B2. Uh, there's a, uh, information made available to the City Manager late today that may uh, uh, fortunately force the City into litigation both as the Airport Authority and the City Council. So I'd like for uh, you to add closed session so we can go into closed session pursuant to Government Code uh, 54956.9B. Uh, to discuss potential litigation. I'll move the findings to add it to the agenda. In favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, that's unanimous. Item will be dealt with in closed session with other closed session items, and if there is reportable action, uh, that will occur when we come out of closed session. Next, we have the Victorville Redevelopment Agency, uh, and we have any revisions to the uh, Agenda? Yes, uh, staff has requested that item number four be continued to September 18th. Uh, we have the consent calendar. And for second. We have item uh, on the Victorville Water District. We have uh, the consent calendar, item number three. Move for approval. Second. Item number four. It's a request to award a contract to Murrow Metals Corporation for SALA uh, for the industrial wastewater treatment plant in the amount of uh, $1,798,400. Uh, $1, $1,798,400. Move for approval. We have the City Council agenda, item number two, revisions. 
Again, Mayor Cabrillas, I would like to add the same closed session that we did uh, under the Airport Authority pursuant to Government Code 54954.2B2 uh, to discuss potential litigation uh, related to the information of the City Manager. Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Item number three. We have a continued public hearing. And at this time, I will open up the public hearing. This is on a development department is requesting a continuance of case number Development 09-0004 to the meeting of August 18, 2009, in order to complete internal review of study. Should I go ahead and open open up the, the meeting, the, the public hearing? Okay. I'll open up the public hearing. Anyone wishing to address the council on item number three? Or against? Hearing none, I will continue the public hearing. August, we will continue the public hearing to August the 18th. Item number four is a public hearing. Public hearing call to hear arguments for or against the adoption of ordinance number 2245. And I will now open up the public hearing on item number four. Anyone wishing to speak for or against item number four? Um, Will you state your your name and address for the for the record? My please? name is David Lopez. My home address. My home address. Yes. One four one two three, Dapple Court, Victorville. On item number four. No, I'm sorry. You know what? The one I need to talk about is number five. Okay. Yeah, I'll wait on that. I will now close the public hearing, and I would entertain a motion to um, I need to read, read the that. title. Yeah. Okay, an ordinance of the City Council, City of Victorville, ratifying ordinance number 2244, which extended the moratorium on the establishment of medical marijuana dispensaries and the distribution of medical marijuana at businesses in the City of Victorville. Approval. Second. Item number five is a public hearing called to hear arguments for or against the introduction of ordinance number 2246. And I do have, I will open up the public hearing. And I do have two cards here. One is for Maria Lopez. Okay, I'm not too clear if it's against medical marijuana, but if it, it is, um, I'm speaking on public hearing number five ordinance 2246 that it is being declared that an establishment maintenance or operation of a business that conducts activities in violation of the state or federal law and declaring as a public nuisance that it is a nuisance to operate medical marijuana dispensaries within the city of Victorville. Definition of a nuisance, a public nuisance is defined as an inconvenience or troublesome offense First of all, it's the state law, so we're not offending anyone because we have guidelines and laws to abide by. An inconvenience to who? We're not drug dealers, we're a business. First of all, medical cannabis is not a nuisance in my opinion because it helps patients with ailments such as arthritis, cancer, etc. What is a nuisance in your minds? I hope you can reach an agreement on this subject and consider the disabled persons and veterans. Thank you. David Lopez.
Good afternoon. Uh, once again, it, it's not clear, at least to me, whether this is a good thing, a positive thing for a business, or is this a negative thing? I mean, can we at least get that answer? If it's a negative or a positive thing? Well, this is a public hearing you, for you to either voice your opposition or okay. your support for the ordinance. All right. Well, the thing is, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's a state law. We know that. Uh, the, the city council, and I, I don't know if you guys are trying to do this or not, but, you know, when you say you're breaking state or federal law, uh, we all know it's, it's legal in the state. We already went through that. Uh, you're not the federal department. It's not your department to handle this and so on. Um, you're not in violation of issuing a license to someone who wants to open up a business. You're protected by the law of the state of California. The federal department will deal with their own problems in their own ways. Um, also, uh, you know, we, we talked about before, we honor these soldiers that go out and fight for us, you know. I was an airborne ranger back in the Army in my day. You know, and you get patted on the back, thank you for a great job, and so on. Then they forget about you. You get disabled and you get hurt in your lifetime. Whether it's through the military or whether it's through your work. And, you know, you come across a situation. Uh, the use of medical cannabis, I explained before, helps me. To, to take away that from me uh, is, I believe, is a violation in my Disability Act rights. And I don't know if this is, a, you know, the way I'm reading it, it sounds like it's something to stop. If it's not, and if it's an ordinance in case, you know, the, the, the business goes outside of this, we can use this against you, then that's a good thing. But if it's against it, and if it's just to shut it down completely, it's wrong, and it's a violation of uh, the rights of our veterans. What about these guys that come home? They may come home with no arms or legs or back problems. They may choose to use cannabis. They may live in our cities, and I'm sure there's a few that we already celebrated here, and they choose to do this. But you're already deciding for them that, you know what, you guys have to drive to L.A. Sorry, buddy, you know, but thanks for doing what you did out there. You know, sorry you lost your legs or, you know. And too bad for you. We know you're disabled, but hey, great job, you know, like they do to all of us. You gotta reconsider, you know. Uh, it's not your personal feelings here. You can't use your personal feelings involved in this. You know, you really, if you got the money, if this turns out, we say, well, you know what, this isn't gonna pass, we're gonna stop it, it votes, it's blocked, you know, and so on. Mr. Lopez, I'm, you have about 10 minutes, uh, 10 seconds. Uh, I'm going to go further. I'm not stopping here. I'm telling you, I'm going to go further. And if you got that kind of a money to afford and waste on, 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 you know, whatever it takes, then God bless us all, you know. Nothing personal. I hope you guys reconsider. I hope I'm wrong and I'm reading this wrong, but. Your yeah. time's up. Thank you. Thank you. I will not close the public hearing. And I would have the uh, title of the ordinance read. In ordinance of the City Council of the City of Victorville, adding sections to Chapter 1302, 13.02 of the Victorville Municipal Code, declaring as a public nu nuisance the establishment, maintenance, or operation of a business that conducts activities in violation of state or federal law, and declaring as a public nuisance the establishment, maintenance, or operation of medical marijuana dispensaries within the City of Victorville. Who we'll wait for the reading? and introduction of the proposed ordinance. Second. <clears throat> Chair Cameras, I think Mr. Lopez uh, deserves a response to his comments. Uh, the ordinance as written would prohibit that type of an establishment in the city of Victorville. Next is the consent calendar. Move for approval. <laughs> Item number seven. They request to approve amendment number one to the uh, contract with uh, M.W. Uh, Belt and Associates for services at the door of Davis Park. Mm -hmm. 
approval. Second. Here, Cabriel, uh, somewhat related to that, I just would like for the council to know. Staff who were not there. We had the Doris Davis Memorial uh, last Thursday. Uh, which was there. Mr. Cox was there. Um, but I, the comment I wanted to make is that I wanted to, uh, I wanted to compliment uh, John Gargan and Captain Reynolds. Uh, they were on the committee to put the thing together. It was a huge success, and a great deal of the credit goes to their efforts and, and to their presentations that night. Uh, it was great for Doris, and uh, they did uh, a good job representing our city. So I just want to acknowledge uh, John Gargan and Captain Reynolds' role in what absolutely huge, huge event. It's a great tribute to a wonderful person that we knew for a long time. Thank you. Item number eight is a request to adopt resolution number 09069. Matt Cabrias, this is not technically a public hearing, but it is a hearing for the benefit of the property owner. So I would ask that you uh, give any property owners that may be present the opportunity to present any concerns they have to the council. Uh, also, uh, I'm going to request a continuance of this item. Uh, property owners have made it known that they want to follow a procedure which is outlined and now being uh, requested by Caltrans, which requires a hearing before CTC, which is add potentially five to 90 days to the process. Uh, in the Caltrans manual that we have no control over, uh, something that previously Caltrans has not necessarily enforced, but are requesting and providing the property owner with the opportunity uh, to go through that proceeding. So, uh, I'd like for you to give the property owners an opportunity to be heard, but then I'm going to request. Yeah, I go ahead and open up a public hearing. But yes, it's not a public hearing. Not, a public hearing. Not, not a public hearing, but if there's any property owners that would like to speak. Okay, on item eight and nine, are there any property owners that uh, would like to speak on, on the item? Item number eight and nine. Not, then we'll continue the item. And I, I want to no. put on the record to comment on this item and the other one. I sat on that sandbag board for many years here, and Ryan's on the board now, lucky him. But this is a classic example of the dysfunctional attitude that's in this state when it comes to processing our projects in a timely fashion. Uh, this delay to go to the state, uh, state board for a review of something that is so mechanical and and pervasive that it doesn't even it doesn't even uh, raise to the level of, of protecting your property rights and yet it's one of those little bits of pieces in there just like the environmental movement uses from time to time to hold up our uh, highway and freeway projects um, again this should never be here but it is and the language is in there and the language is in there for a very good reason to slow down and harass the process I'm a, I, I, I was born in this state, and I, I tell you, it's a, it's become a very dysfunctional state. It's all wrapped around how slow they can go, for in all good, all due respect to the state uh, uh, job protection. The more work you have sitting out there in those bureaucracies, those unaccountable bureaucracies that don't stand for election or uh, for us or anybody else, uh, this is the kind of actions that go on. That this shouldn't be on here, but yet it is. It's legal. It's there. And we have to comply with it. But these kind of cleanup things are what this state ought to be about. If we ever get to a constitutional convention, which may not be too far down the road, uh, the minutia of things that, that are, we're talking about now ought to be addressed in those type of things. Maybe clean up the calendar and start with a brand new state again that has some, uh, some kind of functionality to its bureaucracy and accountability, too, I might add. Yeah, I'd like to make comments as well. Um, I agree with the sentiment of Councilman Rothschild. I disagree with our city attorney's estimate of time, and I'm willing to make a wager, uh, Mr. D. Bordanowski, that uh, you're looking probably at a five or six month delay in the process minimum. And if this goes all the way to the CTC uh, in Sacramento for a, for a hearing, which I suspect, based on the players, that it may well do that, uh, I would guess that you could add a year to the process 
of going forward with the Nisqually interchange. It is absolutely ludicrous that at this late stage in the game, you have a bureaucrat waving a pen that effectively delays the project and undoubtedly will result in more costs. Well, I hope you're wrong, but I'm not taking the bet. <laughs> <laughs> That was for item eight and nine. Uh, I'd like, if possible, to handle nine separately, just separately, to give okay. the property owner their opportunity okay. as well. We have item number nine, and it's a request to adopt resolution number 09070. Is there any property owner in the audience that would uh, like to speak to item number nine? This, also, this item will also be continued. Continuance of the item the next agenda and then we probably will keep continuing it until we hear back from CTC. Me too. Motion to continue. continue. Motion to continue. Okay. I'll move. Nine. Second. Item number 10 is a request uh, from Council to approve amendment number 3 to the design cooperative agreement between the City of Victorville and State of California for the La Mesa and Esqually interchange. It's for an amount of uh, $4,823,000. Move for approval. Okay. That's an amount of uh, money coming to the city of Victorville for clarification. Item number 11 is a request for uh, to approve a sheltering agreement with Victor Valley Animal Protective League for fiscal year 2009-2010, budgeting the amount of $185,000 for sub services. Cool. Item number 12 is a request to accept, uh, accept offer to purchase two uh, gas engine generator units at Foxborough. And we do have, before we get into the, the, the uh, information here from our staff, we do have Norm Miller that wants to speak to the item. Council members, my name is Norman Miller, and I just had a couple questions. Uh, generators cost us originally. Do we know that? We have staff. Can that Pardon, you'll have that? What Which you other one? I'm just curious how much we made or lost on this well, whole thing. I, I can have staff, uh, you know, qu answer um, that. provide okay. you an answer. But right. Thank is you. there another question? or is that what No, that was me. I'm just curious yes. what that was. Honorable Mayor, Council Member, these two units that we're selling at uh, Foxborough, and the reason for sale is that we are now interconnected with S with the Edison, and we no longer use this. We use these units to uh, generate electricity. And the the original costs were, I believe, were around seven hundred fifty thousand each for these units. Um, but but we ran them. We ran them for a long time. There's a lot of hours on these uh, on these units. These units are more like a used car that we're selling. Um, the, 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 the sale earlier that we had of the equipment was new equipment that we had never used. So it's, uh, you can look at the cost of acquisition and then cost of selling that equipment and uh, figure out what the loss is. In this case, uh, we believe we are getting the price for what it's worth and the rest of the use uh, we did, we did use the, for the life of the 
uh, the equipment, we use them. So therefore, uh, even though we're losing the, the money on this, it's, it's, it's like selling an old car. Uh, when you bought it new, you sold it old, you're selling it for the value, whether it's at the market. Um, so we believe that it's a, it's a good offer for these two units. We have four of these. We have two at SCLA. We are using them right now to generate electricity. Um, these two have been sitting for, for a while. We have surplus them. So uh, that's my presentation. If you have any other questions. Um, yeah, some information came to me as I uh, late today on the, on the equipment. Um, the recollection I had was there about 750,000 each, but what was shared with me was something I wasn't familiar with today, and I'm not sure is true. The veracity of that, and I'd ask you before you consummate the deal that you check, follow through, and check this. And that was that Caterpillar was responsible for ad enhancing the equipment with some uh, air quality uh, mitigation that was, according to this information, never applied that would add substantial value to the equipment. Uh, so I. For my part, at least, uh, before you close the deal with Caterpillar, they're the ones that were responsible for the original equipment and the uh, upgrade to that equipment. Uh, they never met the air quality standards that they were supposed to meet, and that equipment is rather valuable, especially with the green movement going on in this state today. Uh, so even though they're offering, I guess, 150, 158,000 for one and 138,000 for the other because of the differential in the hours run on each one, uh, that you check on that uh, aspect of those engines and see, see what Caterpillar has to say about that. Uh, what, did we ever get that equipment in play? Because uh, it does add value to it. The equipment uh, that you're referring to, Council Member, was uh, it's equipment that, that's used for air quality. Um, depending on where this equipment is used, it may or may not have the value. I believe we, we uh, did not finish installation of the equipment because there was added cost. There was added cost to these uh, units that were just sitting there. Therefore, they, we didn't really see the need to finish. I, I will get a report and I will send it forward to the city manager uh, for, uh, for his review. But basically, uh, the information that I have on this is that we did not finish installation of those uh, units because it didn't add any value for us to have that on there. Now, if it added value to the unit or not, I'll find out and I'll I'll forward you that information. But you're going to find that out before you make the sale to Caterpillars, right? Because the other part of the other side of this question is, if in fact there is some significant value added to that equipment and we're selling it at, let's say, 150 and the equipment, and I'm just picking some numbers, I'm not suggesting uh, it, that ramps it up to 200 or 300,000 or something. If that equipment had been applied and not been applied, then that ought to be accredited because we're selling it back to Caterpillar, who's the one that was responsible for the original contract. If that's the wish of the council, that's what we will do. Okay, yeah, that's that's all. I just want to put that caution because I, I don't know how much of that is true or not. I haven't seen the contracts, but I've just you know, been a vice president. As I looked at it, I said, okay, if there's something that ought to be there and it adds value, Caterpillar ought to recognize it, tell us about it, give us, you know, quantify a number on top of that. If they say, no, it, it doesn't apply because we did do it and maintained it, uh, then let me know that too. Let the council, excuse me, let the council know, uh, report back on that. On those because you're, you plan to sell some more of the, those those uh, pieces, right? Or is that the only two we have? Um, these uh, we have four of these. Two of them we're using two of them, and there is two that are sitting at us uh, Foxborough. These two are the ones that are sitting at Foxborough, and our plan is to to sell these. Okay. Now these here have substantial hours on them, as I understand. They do have substantial amount of hours on them. Questions? I entertain a motion on item number 12. Move for approval. And I request that the motion also include the uh, revision on the agenda that the city manager has made the declaration these are surplus. Second. Second. Item 13 is uh, presentations for reports from council members. I'll start to my right. I have none. Well, I just want to echo the um, 
some of the comments that were made by Councilman Caldwell and Rothschild on this Caltrans issue. Um, since I am our representative of Sandbag, uh, I do intend to bring this up to them. I expect that they, along with us, um, will hopefully partner in trying to, uh, to push back on, on this particular issue. And if nothing else, I'd like, I'd like us to consider asking our uh, senator or assemblyman to um, draft legislation to get rid of this process. So that's, that's what I'm going to try to do. Sorry, I would agree with you, Ryan. When you think about the, the, the years that it takes to do some of these projects and uh, at the detriment to, to the community that, that desperately, uh, desperately needs the, uh, the interchange, for example, and, and to have someone at the last, uh, almost the last minute, uh, come up with some, some rule that's been hidden away somewhere in, in the books, it's, uh, it's not good for us. So. Uh, any other comment from council? Just one, I would add even waive all environmental reviews on freeway interchanges and additional lanes to freeways to that type of a bill. I mean, that's another uh, environmental area that not only costs money and adds a year or two to the process, <coughs> but is not necessary because all the environmental reviews were done when the original projects were put in play. Not a bad idea, but I wanted to get past committee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, that concludes our meeting. We do have uh, one item closed session. Closed session. Potential litigation since government code uh, 54956.9b. There is no reportable action as a result of the city's uh, closed session held pursuant to. Adjourned.